Um, hi, I'm, I'm pleased to see some new people here. I am Christian Stevenson. I am with the Mississippi State University Extension Service uh, in Hancock County. Uh, very happy to see everyone here today. Um, as I was saying, the, the purpose of today is really to talk about the role of different nutrients uh, and what they do in the plant uh, and a little bit how we can recognize some of the problems that come about if we have deficiencies of those nutrients. Uh, and so when we talk about the, the nutrients in plants, uh, there are a, a number of essential elements that plants have to take up uh, in order to complete their life cycles uh, because those elements make up the, you know, just a really important part of the structure of the plant uh, or its metabolism, how it, it, how it photosynthesizes or, or respires, um, how it grows and develops and reproduces. Uh, so they make up all of the, the proteins and the carbohydrates and everything else that are a, a part of the plant. Uh, they're used for energy storage. Uh, a lot of them, uh, particularly micronutrients, are used as enzyme cofactors. Uh, so again, part of the metabolic processes of the plant. Or they're used to maintain the movement of water through the plant and the movement of other nutrients through the plant. Uh, so. Uh, you'll see different numbers. Uh, sometimes you'll see 16 or 17 essential elements, uh, but you can see here just a picture of the, the periodic table uh, with, uh, with most of the essential elements picked out. Uh, and we're going to talk about a fair few of these and, and what they do in the plant. And again, how to recognize if you have a problem with one of these particular nutrients. Uh, and one of the things that I, I think is really interesting uh, and I, I, for this purpose, I, I uh, appropriated this table from a uh, publication from the uh, Texas Extension Service or their AgriLife Center, uh, is to look at the different nutrients that plants take up uh, and the relative amounts that those, uh, those uh, elements are required in. Of course, when we think about plant nutrients, uh, the big ones are going to be carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, of course, carbon, uh, you get that from carbon dioxide, uh, and uh, that is, of course, a, an essential part of the process of photosynthesis. Uh, oxygen comes into the plant through water that's taken up through the roots, uh, and hydrogen is taking up, taken up as part of water as well. Uh, those, are, those elements are really important. Um, don't often run into issues with, uh, with deficiencies in those. Uh, when we normally think about fertilization, uh, the three most important ones that we always consider are going to be nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Uh, and you can see relative to carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, uh, they make up quite a bit less of the, uh, of the structure of the plant, uh, but still very important. Um, and then we have other elements like calcium and magnesium and sulfur. Uh, and you can see again, a, a reducing uh, amount of those nutrients that are going to be required all the way down to elements like zinc and boron. Uh, and you can look down there, the plant really doesn't require an awful lot of molybdenum, uh, but despite that, it's still essential uh, that the plant has that very small amount in order for that uh, to, to serve in the important uh, role that it has in the plant in, in you know, being an enzyme that keeps those reactions going uh, in the process of the plant making energy or breaking energy back down uh, or breaking sugars back down uh, in order to, to do all the things that the plant needs to do. Uh, what I'd also kind of point out on this slide is you'll see there where, where it talks about mode of uptake. Uh, and other than carbon, uh, most of that uptake is either going to be is going to be one of two things. It's either mass flow or root interception. Uh, and what's really important there is all of that has to come from the soil. The only element that we are getting from the air is carbon. Uh, so mass flow or root interception uh, is just a matter of whether that nutrient is coming towards the plant. Uh, in water or whether the, the roots are uh, reaching out for it. 
Um, so really important that we take care of our soil in order to take care of our plants. Uh, when we talk about levels of nutrients, uh, what we really want is to have just an adequate amount of that nutrient present in the soil. Uh, below a, a certain point that we're going to call the critical concentration, uh, we're going to run into a problem of a nutrient deficiency. The plant's not going to be able to uh, grow the way it needs to because it's lacking one of the essential ingredients that it needs uh, in order to develop. Uh, somewhat less commonly, uh, we run into an issue where we have too much of a particular nutrient, uh, and then we get into a toxicity. Uh, these are, are far less common. I, I don't run into them very frequently at all uh, when people are, uh, you know, when I'm trying to diagnose a, a nutrient problem or what I would call an abiotic problem with the plant. But it is possible that we can oversupply some of these nutrients. Uh, just far more commonly, we run into an issue of a deficiency. Uh, now, when we see deficiencies in plants, there are some symptoms uh, that are particularly common. Um, and uh, generally uh, tend to show up and show up in a few different ways. Uh, one of the most common symptoms of a nutrient deficiency is chlorosis, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying yellowing of the plant. Uh, and that chlorosis can be uh, general or, or essentially affect all of, those, all of the areas of the plant, uh, what you would see in the middle picture there. Uh, or in some instances, we can get what's called intervenal chlorosis, uh, where you see uh, that yellowing between the veins of the plant or veins of the leaf, uh, but the veins still stay green. Uh, in some other issue, uh, in some other situations, we can have uh, what we call necrosis. Uh, necrosis is just dead tissue on the plant, uh, and that may be marginal, where that's around the edges of the leaf, uh, or it can be in spots throughout the leaf. And sometimes you'll see that again. You'll see that in a uh, intervenal. Uh, necrosis where the areas between the leaf veins are dying off. So when we talk about nutrient deficiencies, uh, it really kind of comes down to two things that we want to look at. The first of those uh, is going to be the function of that element. What that element does in the plant uh, is kind of going to be reflected in what we see in the plant when we don't have enough of it. Uh, the other thing that's going to be important is how mobile that element is within the plant. There are some elements that we would refer to as being mobile, uh, and that would be nitrogen and phosphorus and uh, potassium, uh, magnesium or, or chlorine. Uh, and those, the plant is able to essentially move them through the plant from old leaves to younger leaves. The plant wants to favor that new growth. Uh, and so if it doesn't have some of that, uh, that nutrient, what it will do is it'll just take it away from the old leaves and give it to the younger leaves so that they can develop properly. Uh, now we also have some elements that once they're in a spot in the plant really can't be broken back down and move somewhere else. We see that with boron and iron and calcium. And so um, what that winds up being, or what winds up happening because of that, is it, it will determine where you see the symptoms of a nutrient deficiency. So if you have an, an element that is mobile, you tend to see that nutrient deficiency in the older parts of the plant first, if it's immobile, you tend to see that nutrient deficiency in the new growing part of the plant. Uh, and that's just, again, that's a function of whether the plant can move that nutrient from one place to another. Uh, now, kind of in the middle there, you do have some uh, plants that are, are kind of intermediate. Uh, they can, or, or some nutrients that are kind of inter intermediate, they can be moved, but not as easily as one of the mobile nutrients can. Uh, and in that situation, rather than really seeing the problem show up at the 
older part of the plant or the newer part of the plant, you tend to kind of see it evenly throughout the plant as the, the plant is able to move some of the nutrient, but maybe not enough. Uh, so now I want to get in and, and talk about some of the different nutrients. I'm, I'm not going to uh, go through every single one, um, but a fair few of them. Uh, and uh, probably the first one that we think of is nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is extraordinarily important for plant development, particularly for vegetative growth. Uh, and it's important in the, the production of proteins and enzymes. Uh, NADPH is an, an energy storage uh, molecule that's used in the plant. Uh, it's used in the production of amino acids that make up proteins. Uh, and it's used in the production of chlorophyll. So, uh, you know, keep, kind of keep in mind that it's used in the production of chlorophyll uh, because one of the really important signs that we see when we don't have enough nitrogen is that chlorosis. So the younger leaves uh, are gonna stay green longer, but you start to see yellowing on some of the older leaves. Uh, it's kind of like the plant is losing a little bit of that chlorophyll. Uh, nitrogen is really easy to move through the plant. Uh, so again, we tend to see the symptoms on the lower part of the plant or the older part of the plant uh, before we would see it on younger leaves. Uh, kind of a, you know, one of the elements that we do occasionally see excess nitrogen being uh, delivered to the plant, uh, and that really comes down to, uh, you know, you know over-fertilization. Uh, and when that happens, we tend to get kind of an overgrowth, really, really lush growth of the plant because, you know, the, the plant wants to compete for all the nitrogen that's there in the soil. So it really wants to take it up. Uh, it can't hold on to it. It needs to use it. Uh, and so it, it produces vegetative growth. Uh, and so sometimes we'll see the plant put on really lush growth uh, and uh, it may lodge over or fall over as a result of kind of growing, uh, growing out of itself or growing too fast for itself. Uh, another issue that you see with uh, over fertilization and nitrogen uh, is the plants become very attractive to insects. All of that lush growth will, uh, will really bring them in. Uh, and of course, we really want to limit over fertilization with nitrogen uh, because it does tend to lead to that nitrogen leaching away. Uh, and winding up down in the in the ditch, uh, and eventually in our rivers and streams, we we don't want to see that happen. Uh, another one of the the key nutrients is phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is uh, really important in making the the genetic molecules uh, for the plant, the RNA and the DNA that uh, uh, are uh, kind of directing the cell to do everything that it's doing. Uh, it also makes up an important part of cell walls, uh, which are uh, the component called phospholipids. Uh, and it's important in energy for the plant. So NA ATP and NADP uh, are both chemicals that the, the plant uses for energy. So when we don't have enough phosphorus, we tend to, uh, to have kind of a, a stunting effect on the plant. Uh, the plant has a really short uh, growth, uh, growth habit. Uh, and we'll often see kind of a purple coloration. Uh, and you can see that there in the, uh, the image that's on this slide. Uh, and you may see a little bit of, of you know, sort of dead spots appearing on the leaf uh, as you have a, a severe issue with this. Uh, again, you tend to see this on the lower parts of the plant or the older parts of the plant first uh, because it is a mobile nutrient. Uh, one thing that occasionally people get confused with phosphorus deficiencies, uh, particularly in the early spring, if we're growing seedlings out, uh, plants that are really young, if, it, if it's cool outside and they're put near a window or something like that, and particularly if they're in contact with a window, will develop that purple coloration in response to cold. Uh, so that's just something that can be confused with, phos uh, with a phosphorus deficiency. Uh, potassium is going to be the, the third ma macronutrient, uh, the, the third component of most fertilizers that we would go and buy at a big box store. Uh, potassium is really important in how water balance operates in the plant uh, and whether water and, and other things can actually move in and out of cells. 
Uh, and so when we have uh, too, uh, too little potassium, uh, we tend to see a, a, a yellowing, particularly around the outside of the leaves, uh, and we see the older leaves start to die off. Uh, and again, a mobile nutrient, so we tend to see these symptoms in the older leaves. Uh, now, of course, those are, the, those are the big macronutrients, but there are an awful lot of other nutrients that are, that are involved. Um, sulfur is really important for the development of proteins and the development of cell walls. Uh, and it's one of the intermediate plant, intermediate plant nutrients in terms of its mobility. Um, so when we don't have enough sulfur, we wind up with a general chlorosis. Uh, so the entire plant, top to bottom, uh, tends, to, uh, tends to turn yellow on us. Uh, magnesium, uh, we see, uh, we see a, a good bit more often in terms of a deficiency. Uh, really necessary for the uh, development of chlorophyll for the plant. I see I have chlorophyll misspelled on my slide. Uh, and really typically with magnesium, uh, you, uh, uh, you wind up with that intervenal chlorosis again on the older leaves, uh, which tells you again that it's a relatively mobile nutrient. Uh, and with all of these, these lesser nutrients or, or nutrients that are required in smaller amounts, uh, I often get asked, where do we get the, uh, uh, the, this particular nutrient for the plant? Uh, sulfur, very often we get that in the form of ammonium sulfate, uh, which is commonly used as a nitrogen source. Uh, so very often we're just adding the sulfur along with the other, uh, other nutrients that we're adding. Uh, occasionally, you can also supply sulfur in the form of zinc sulfate, uh, or you can, uh, you know, elemental sulfur is available, uh, but I would not recommend applying that, generally speaking, uh, because it tends to acidify soils. Uh, and if the soil is particularly wet, uh, it can, uh, can lead to uh, some, pro some other problems with the plant uh, with, uh, with how that sulfur reacts in the soil. Uh, magnesium is normally added to the soil uh, by, uh, by using dolomitic limestone. Uh, so when you purchase limestone, most, most garden lime uh, is going to be what we call dolomitic limestone, uh, and that includes magnesium as a part of the, uh, the product. Uh, so often we're adding that magnesium in as we're liming the soil. Uh, of course, another popular source of magnesium uh, is Epsom salts, uh, and Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. Uh, so those include both magnesium and sulfur uh, and uh, uh, can be beneficial for the plant if you have one of those deficiencies. Uh, calcium is uh, another Im important nutrient for the plant. Uh, it's really important in the formation of cell walls uh, and the, uh, the deficiency of calcium is probably one of the most common ones I get asked about uh, because when you have a calcium deficiency, you tend to get a kind of a deformed uh, or, or necrotic younger leaf, dying uh, younger leaves, or the, the tip of the plant will die off. Uh, more commonly, what I see as a, a calcium issue uh, is blossom end rot in tomatoes and peppers and squash and a, a range of other vegetables. Uh, and we're all familiar with that. Uh, you're really happy to see that first red tomato on the plant. Uh, and you look at the bottom of it and it's got that dead spot on it. Um, so uh, while that technically is a calcium deficiency, calcium is not a mobile nutrient. So calcium has to continually be taken up by the plant. Uh, and if you have any interruption in that because there's a, a water, uh, too much water or too little water uh, or uneven watering, uh, you wind up with calcium not being supplied to that growing tip on that fruit, uh, and that's why you see that, that dying off. Very, very infrequently uh, do we see an actual calcium deficiency. Uh, whenever we lime, we're adding calcium to the soil. Uh, there's, there's already generally a, a good amount of calcium present. Uh, so normally we don't really have a calcium issue, we have an uptake problem. So the best way to solve that is to just keep our, uh, uh, our watering as even as we possibly can. Uh, there are uh, some calcium products uh, like uh, uh, Rot Stop and other things that are a liquid uh, formulation. 
uh, that you can add to the garden just to add extra calcium uh, to kind of help with that problem. Uh, there have been a few, uh, I've seen a few recommendations for, you know, doing things like crushing up eggshells uh, or crushing up Tums, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, things you put in water and, uh, and uh, help you with an upset stomach, uh, because those, pro those things do contain calcium. <clears throat> uh, the issue with, uh, with eggshells is they do take quite a long time to break down and become available. Uh, with Tums, uh, I worked it out at one point at how many actual pill, how many of the tablets you would need to apply uh, because they don't actually contain that much calcium. Uh, so really, again, lime you know liming properly is going to resolve that, uh, or using one of those rock stop products uh, that are just a calcium additive uh, is going to help you deal with that problem. Uh, iron deficiency does come up pretty often. Uh, I do see iron chlorosis uh, fairly often on plants. Uh, it's used in all sorts of different enzymes and proteins and moving electrons around in the plant. Uh, and we tend to see uh, chlorosis or that intervenal yellowing uh, on, the, uh, on the younger leaves. Uh, you can see several images of that there. Um, iron is, again, relatively easy to apply. You can, uh, you can purchase iron uh, uh, supplements to, uh, to add to your soil. Uh, at, uh, at most of your uh, garden stores. Uh, the, the strangest recommendation I have heard uh, for adding iron, particularly to trees, uh, is to drive nails into them to somehow um, apply, uh, you know, get iron into the plant. Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> uh, uh, that is not a good way to supply iron to the, uh, to the plant. Uh, you really need to get that into the soil uh, in, a, in a really easy form for that plant to be able to use. Uh, so go and buy a, an iron supplement rather than, uh, uh, than uh, doing anything with a hammer and nail. Uh, manganese is really important in the development of the part of the plant uh, where, uh, where the, the process of photosynthesis happens. Uh, those are called the chloroplasts, uh, and manganese makes up an important part of that. Um, when we have a deficiency of manganese, we tend to see uh, that intervenal chlorosis. Uh, you can see those really kind of characteristics, uh, characteristic dead spots. Uh, and I really like, you know, uh, I like to include that because, you know, uh, one, of the th one of the comments I'll make later uh, is that it can be kind of difficult sometimes to differentiate or, or tell the uh, uh, plant, you know, plant nutrient deficiencies from some of the disease problems that we have. Uh, and so that's, you know, kind of a good image to keep in mind uh, of how do we tell these nutrient deficiencies apart from, you know, some of these other diseases that we may need to, to work with. Uh, boron, uh, really important for the development of cell walls. Uh, we do see uh, nutrient deficiencies uh, for uh, crucifers, uh, broccoli and cauliflower and things like that. Uh, and particularly for them, uh, you tend to see that, that uh, kind of hollowness in the stem that develops because of a lack of boron. Uh, and oftentimes when, you, we're, when we are coming up with a fertilization recommendation, uh, if you're growing one of those brassica crops, we will recommend an addition of boron to the soil, uh, which is really easy to do uh, just by adding boric acid. Uh, chlorine, uh, not a, not a uh, chemical that you generally uh, need a whole lot of. It's, it's one of the lesser uh, nutrients where you, you don't need a very, very much of it at all, uh, but it is very important in, uh, in splitting water uh, during photosynthesis, uh, as well as uh, it's involved in cell division and the growth of the plant. Uh, so when we don't have enough of it, we tend to get these uh, you know, necrotic spots on the plant, dying areas. Uh, you can see the grass up at the top there with all those, uh, all those yellow spots on it. Uh, I tend to see that on the older leaves before you'll see it on the newer leaves. Uh, not one I've honestly ever run into. It's one of those things that's possible, but, but very infrequent. Um, and it's an interesting case where, uh, of course, the, the form that the plant takes up is a chloride, 
Uh, so it's a, not, not just chlorine itself, because chlorine can actually have a, a toxicity is, issue associated with it. Uh, zinc uh, normally comes up when I am talking to people about pecans, um, because we do often use uh, additional zinc when we are uh, fertilizing pecans. Uh, when we don't have enough of it, uh, you tend to see a, a whirl of leaves at the very top of the plant that's distorted or puckered. Uh, kind of curled up, uh, but you know more. You know more frequently, we're just adding this as a supplement uh, when uh, when we're growing pecans. But if you need to add zinc, uh, zinc sulfate would be the uh, the really common uh, fertilized product that you would add. Um, getting to the end of these, molybdenum. Uh, you can see uh, as a result of molybdenum deficiency. Uh, this is in poinsettia, and you can see that uh, that really marginal yellowing on the plant. Uh, sometimes you'll get a little bit of a twisted leaf, and uh, uh, because you know, one thing that's really interesting about this is different the presence or absence of different nutrients affects the way that other nutrients can be picked up. Um, so, uh, with a lack of molybdenum you may actually see the development of symptoms for nitrogen deficiency because those different, uh, different nutrients kind of interact with one another. Uh, copper, not gonna spend a whole lot of time with it. You get a, a, a kind of twisted younger leaves. Uh, again, not one that I have uh, ever encountered, uh, but uh, just another nutrient that's used for the plant. Uh, now, the most important thing we can do uh, if we want to diagnose a nutrient deficiency uh, is soil testing. Uh, you know, any extension service, no matter what state you're in, does this, uh, or you can send off a sample of your soil uh, and have that tested, and they'll come back with the levels of the nutrients uh, that are available there for the, uh, for the plant to take up. Uh, now, they don't test, at least here, they don't test for every single micronutrient that you might need. Uh, you'll see uh, measurements for, for some of the, the sort of more critical ones like magnesium. Uh, but uh, they will, you know, certainly let you know, you know, how much nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium you may need uh, and whether for the particular crop you're growing, uh, if you need to pay particular attention to one of those micronutrients. Um, if you're still having a problem or if you've got a plant that is um, you know, despite, you know, you, you've done the things that soil testing tells you to do, uh, there's kind of another step that goes beyond that, uh, where we take samples of the leaves of the plant uh, and uh, send those off for tissue analysis. And rather than uh, looking at what nutrients are, actually, are there in the soil, uh, we're actually going to look at what nutrients are present in the leaf. So, we're not looking at what's in the soil, we're looking at what the plant has actually been able to take up from it. Uh, and if we're having a continuing problem with a nutrient deficiency, uh, that's a really good way to figure that out because we can see you know, not only you know, do we have that particular nutrient present, uh, but has the plant been able to access that nutrient? So uh, this is just kind of, a, kind of a quick shot and an easy thing for you to go back to. Uh, and as I normally do, I, I make all my uh, presentation slides available uh, so that you can, uh, you can refer back to this. Uh, but this kind of tells you where are you seeing the symptoms of the particular nutrient deficiency? Are you seeing those on older leaves? Uh, so, you know, nitrogen, you would see yellowing. For phosphorus, you would see uh, that kind of, you know, dark uh, kind of purplish color on lower leaves. Uh, kind of contrasted to sulfur or boron or calcium, uh, where you tend to see those problems up at the top of the plant on the younger leaves. Uh, for another way to look at that, you can uh, use uh, kind of this key here. You know, where am I seeing the symptoms? And I, I'm seeing them on old leaves. Uh, so you can see kind of what the, the possibilities are. Uh, so that might be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, manganese, or magnesium or excuse me, molybdenum, um, you know, are, am I seeing dead spots? Am I not seeing dead spots? And that kind of, you know, lets me make, take another uh, section. Uh, and then am I seeing green veins or yellow veins? 
Uh, and that just kind of helps you narrow down what mineral deficiency or nutrient deficiency uh, you might not you might be dealing with. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, one thing that you really want to pay attention to when you're looking at nutrient deficiencies is that some pathogen symptoms can look very similar to a nutrient deficiency. So one of these images is of a nutrient deficiency, uh, and one of these images is of a plant that's infected with a virus. Uh, and so what we can do to kind of narrow down what might be going on is we look at all of the other plants in the area. Because if you have a nutrient deficiency, it's going to be really uncommon for just one plant to be suffering from that problem. Uh, it's normally going to be, you know, all of the plants in an area that aren't getting that nutrient that they need. Now, where you see uh, with the disease, you're, you're going to have some plants affected uh, and some plants unaffected, and certainly plants that are, you know, more or less affected than others. So uh, if you see all of the plants in an area kind of affected uniformly, uh, that tends to be a really good sign for me uh, that what we're dealing with is a nutrient deficiency or an abiotic problem rather than a, uh, a biotic plant disease, something caused by a bacterium or a fungus or nematode or virus. Uh, it's also important to note when we talk about fertilization uh, that it's really important that we have uh, the pH correct for the plant that we're growing. Uh, pH we, we talk about as being a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of the soil. Uh, and generally what we want you know, for a wide range of plants is somewhere between uh, about 5.5 to about 6.5. And more commonly, a little bit more to the, the top end of that scale from 6 to 6.5. Uh, but what's really important is that pH is really a measure of the positive hydrogen ions that are uh, present in the soil, uh, and it affects how available different nutrients are. And uh, most of the plant nutrients, uh, things like potassium and nitrogen and calcium and magnesium, are all just like that hydrogen, a positively charged ion, and the soil particles are negatively charged. Um, so having enough hydrogen ions there, uh, or the right ratio of hydrogen ions there, kind of takes up that negative charge. Uh, as we uh, all learned long ago, opposites attract. Uh, so having that negative so charged soil particle kind of attracts those uh, positive uh, nutrient ions onto them. What we want them to do is stay in solution so the plant can take them up from the water. We don't want them to bind to those soil particles. So having that right balance of hydrogen ions is really important uh, for, uh, for getting the nutrition right for your plant. Uh, and for that, normally what we're going to be doing is applying a fertilizer. Um, when we talk about fertilizers, um, Uh, generally, what we are going to be uh, looking at uh, is something from a, uh, a garden store. And normally, we, we talk about our fertilizers uh, as being uh, something like 13, 13, 13, or 5, 15, 30. Uh, what these numbers are is a ratio of, a, of the three primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, in that fertilizer. So if it's 5, 15, 30, that product is going to be 5% nitrogen, 15% phosphorus, and 30% potassium. Um, so uh, you, you can just kind of understand that uh, as that ratio. Normally, your recommendations are going to give you the, the actual fertilizer you need to go buy, uh, but uh, sometimes it will say something like actual in, uh, so actual nitrogen. So uh, if you need to apply an a, a one pound of actual nitrogen, uh, you need to keep in mind that for a you know for something like 13, 13, 13, uh, you know each pound of that is only 13 percent nitrogen. Uh, so you're going to need to apply. Uh, I didn't know I'd have to do math today. Uh, somewhere between seven and eight pounds of uh, 
of, of, of that 13% product in order to get an actual pound of nitrogen. Uh, I often get asked about uh, organic fertilizers versus inorganic fertilizers. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on that today because I want to get to your questions. Uh, but when we talk about inorganic fertilizers or mineral fertilizers, uh, here are some examples of those. That's potassium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, urea, triple superphosphate, uh, diammonium phosphate. Uh, what you really want to take away from this is, you know, all of these are relatively simple uh, compounds uh, that are going to be really available for the, the plant to take up. They're going to separate out into their ions. The plant's going to be able to access those nutrients very quickly. Uh, when we talk about organic fertilizers, uh, that's going to be the byproduct or end product of some natural occurring process. So, uh, you might be talking about fish emulsion or a manure product, uh, and generally those nutrients are going to be uh, more uh, in more complicated molecules that take longer to break down. And there are positives and negatives to that. Uh, there are a few uh, organic fertilizers that do come from non-living sources, uh, like uh, Chilean saltpeter or rock, rock uh, phosphate. Uh, but again, most of them are those are going to be things like bone meal or bat guano, uh, seaweed meal. Uh, and you know you want to pay attention to what the different sort of ratios of nutrients in those products are, uh, as well as paying attention to them. I mean, one of the advantages of an organic fertilizer is that they tend to be a better source for some of these micronutrients uh, than just for the the three primary nutrients that we list on the on the bag. So uh, things like seaweed meal tend to be high in micronutrients. Um, you often see a lot of those trace elements and things like fish emulsion or fish meal as well. Uh, so the advantage, of, uh, the advantage of a mineral fertilizer tends to be that it's relatively easy to find. Uh, you can just go down to your local big box store and they tend to be relatively inexpensive. Uh, and you can put them out because they're, they're fairly concentrated uh, you can put them out into your garden fairly easily. Uh, now, one of the problems is we do tend to uh, apply them a little bit too much. Uh, so you may have a problem with runoff or leaching, uh, some problems with, with acidifying your soil. Uh, I wouldn't be too worried about the impurities, but uh, you often do see that uh, uh, listed as a, a disadvantage for them. Uh, Probably more importantly, uh, you know, if you're just using mineral fertilizers, uh, you do need to pay attention to the addition of micronutrients, uh, you know, on a regular basis, because those mineral, you know, we're not adding back those micronutrients with those mineral fertilizers, um, so we can see a decline in them. They can just get depleted out of the soil, uh, and that can be a, a serious problem. Uh, another issue we can see with micro with uh, mineral fertilizers. Uh, is you can get some damage to the, the good fungi that live in the soil called mycorrhizae. Um, and mycorrhizae associate with the plant in order to help it take up nutrients from the soil. Uh, so uh, you do want to make sure that when you're fertilizing, you're not over fertilizing because that can have negative impacts on these uh, good, good fungi. Uh, now the advantage of organic fertilizer tends to be that it breaks down slowly in the soil. Uh, it promotes good microorganisms, uh, and it promotes good soil structure. Uh, the, the problem with it is often when we're using some of these organic fertilizers, it can be difficult to kind of figure out what nutrients are present in them. We really need to test our organic fertilizer to figure out how much of the nutrients we're actually applying all at once. Um, uh, sorry about that. I've had a technological issue. Um, the, the, the other issue with organic fertilizers is they tend to not be very concentrated. So while you might see a 13, 13, 13 uh, as a common mineral fertilizer, most of the organic fertilizers are going to be things like 244. Uh, so we're gonna need to, to move a whole lot of it. We might need to apply hundreds of pounds to a particular area. Uh, which can make it difficult to transport, can make it cost a lot more. Uh, and you may see some problems with, particularly with manure products, 
uh, contamination with weeds or other things like that. Um, so, um, 